So welcome to this first event of this year's Anchor Point webinar series from the Partnership for the Organization of Innovation and New Technologies, uh, or 4.0 for those who know us. Uh, this morning we have uh, two very special speakers, two fantastic women. Um, I've been an advocate for interdisciplinary work all my career, and these two women that will be that we're here today are the perfect example of highly accomplished interdisciplinary scholars. So let me introduce our two speakers for today's event. Oops, sorry. Oops, sorry. Uh, so Margaret Diel is an associate professor at the Conrad School of Entrepreneurship and Business at the University of Waterloo. She's also co-founder and VP research of the Evidence Network. She holds degrees in business, computer science, and music. She's the one of the rare persons that successfully keeps a foot in both academia and industry. Uh, she conducts research in support of innovation and entrepreneurship policy design and evaluation. And for those who don't, don't know, she's also an extremely accomplished pianist. Uh, Mimosa Sao is the director of analytics at the Evidence Network. She also holds you know, a wide range of degrees in design and engineering, English language and literature, and innovation management. And she's just finished an MBA this summer, so <laughs> fantastic. So her research uh, aims at exploring uncharted territory and activating insights through both qualitative and quantitative research. So it's my great pleasure to welcome both Margaret and Mimosa this morning, who will be telling us the story of the godfathers of artificial intelligence through uh, their ability to transfer knowledge. So Margaret and Mimosa, the floor is yours. I will now stop sharing. And if you have something to share. Okay, well, I'm just gonna make a couple comments and then we'll dig right into it. Um, and Mimosa is gonna make the presentation. But uh, just to say what motivated this research, um, you know, in Canada, we've had a lot of instances where we had a scientific lead or a technological lead, you know, a nuclear and communication satellites, uh, Avro Aero. Um, and, um, you know, we had a very early and significant, important lead in deep learning. And the question is, you know, are we benefiting from this economically? Um, and a precursor to economic benefits would be knowledge transfer from scientists to industry. So this is what has motivated this paper, looking at uh, who has benefited from knowledge transfer from the godfathers of AI, one of which, of course, is Joshua Bengio at uh, University of Montreal. And um, just a little personal history, um, back in like the 1980s and 1990s, when I was manager of the Center for Intelligent Machines at McGill, uh, Jeff Hinton was recruited to Canada from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, that was in 1987. Um, that was a very big deal. That was a big part of the launch of CIR um, or CIFAR now. And at the time, Yasha Bengio was a PhD student in the uh, lab, Center for Intelligent Machines. So it's quite fun 30 years later to be uh, going full circle on this research. So I'm quite excited about the results that we've recently been able to achieve. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to Mimosa to make the presentation. All right, uh, so thanks for introducing us, Catherine. And thanks for the preamble, Margaret. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, is it is it sharing good? Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our project today. Uh, it's about university and industry knowledge transfers um, and the emergence of deep learning. As we all know, university industry knowledge flows are critical in many aspects. First of all, industry relies heavily on external research and much of it has been conducted at universities. And about one third of the US patents rely directly on federal research. Also, when we consider direct and indirect citations, 80% of cited research is linked to future patents and more than 60% of patents are linked to prior research. Furthermore, research has shown that science promotes the diffusion of knowledge. It is found that patents that reference the non-patent literature receive citations at a much higher rate than those that do not cite. 
So given its importance, uh, a review of previous literature on university and industry knowledge flows tells us that geographic proximity matters for such knowledge transfers because not all knowledge is easily codified and transferred. Therefore, geoproximity has been shown to explain some of the variation in knowledge flows. However, its effect may be diminishing due to the falling cost of community and transportation. Uh, and there is a diminished role for localized knowledge spillovers in computing related fields, and this may affect the AI industry as well. Instead, Social proximity, in other words, prior collaborative relationships matter more in this context. Researchers who have considered both geographic proximity and social proximity generally conclude that social proximity is the uh, significant exponential variable. And in terms of this emergence, this emergence phenomenon, there have been studies um, on the emergence of industries but these studies do not consider um, university and industry knowledge flows specifically. Um, for example, studies of, studies of emergence have considered the importance of complementary investments to adoption of novel technologies. They also investigated the evolution of industries by looking at incidents of firm entry and firm exit. As for the studies that point to the effect of emergence on knowledge transfer, they found that local relationships are important for commercial technology development and collaborative relations are essential in the early days of emergence. Speaking of the complexity of knowledge being transferred, collaborative ties are more effective at moderate levels of knowledge complexity. And when there is uncertainty, HAPS can signal quality and increase the flow of academic science into industrial technologies. However, um, those studies have been either uh, qualitative based or cross-sectional. Uh, in other words, they only look at the phenomenon at a single point in time. So to fill in the missing piece, our study is interested to know which AI patterns site got by the research and why. And we also explore how do knowledge transfer pathways evolve during the emergence of deep learning. We use patent citations to Godfather research as our indicator of knowledge transfer. This is also our dependent variable. We conducted cross-sectional analysis to determine which private technology developers are benefiting from the Godfather's research um, and why. More importantly, a longitudinal analysis is conducted to learn how emergence moderates university and industry knowledge flows. So that leads to our uh, hypothesis development. Our hypothesis, our first hypothesis proposed that geo proximity and, and social proximity increase the likelihood of Godfather citation. And this is consistent, um, it's building on the theory from past literature. Our second hypothesis is about the covalinear relationship between emergence and the likelihood of Godfather citation. We propose a U-shaped relationship between emergence and citation to Godfather. This is because at early stages of emergence, there is a diminishing effect as the deep learning community grows. And at later stages, there will be an increasing effect due to validation and increasing performance of deep learning. Our hypothesis three and four uh, consider the moderating effect of emergence. Spe specifically, hypothesis three proposed that emergence moderates the effect of prior collaborative relationships. And hypothesis four proposed that emergence moderates the effect of assignee attack. For example, uh, university assignee versus large company assignee. Before introducing our uh, data sample, uh, here's some contextualizing information. Our study considers the case of the godfathers of artificial intelligence. So there are Jeffrey Hinton from University of Toronto, Yasha Benjo from University of Montreal, and La Yang Le Kun from New York University. So three of them collectively won the 2018 Turing Awards for their work in deep learning. And this Turing Award is considered as the Nobel Prize of Computing. So building upon the case of the, the AI Godfathers, we conducted our research project. 
In terms of emergence, uh, this past decade has witnessed exponential growth of deep learning as indicated by the increase in AI patterns. Also in the same manner, pa paper citations to Godfather research have increased tremendously uh, across the three Godfathers. Um, as mentioned previously, because we use patent citations to Godfather research as our indicator of knowledge transfer, so our data set is um, our data set consists of more than eighteen thousand AI uh, patent families that cite non-patent literature from the patent classes in which Godfather patents are classified. Uh, we also use multiple data resource. Uh, Multiple data sources include PASTAT, Reliance on Science, uh, Geocoding, and Linking Information. As for our results, uh, we find strong effects when patent inventors were former co-inventors or co-authors of the Godfathers, uh, which means the prior collaborative relations is uh, one of the most significant predict predictors. However, uh, geo proximity is only significant uh, in the case of Bengio. So this finding may be related to uh, Bengio's continued efforts in cultivating an AI ecosystem in Montreal and his involvement with some Montreal-based uh, AI companies such as Maluba and Element AI. We also find emergence. Um, here is a deep learning trend variable. It's a significant predictor in the models across uh, Godfathers. It should be noted that the emergence seems to be less effective in Hinton's case compared to Benju and Lacoon, as indicated by uh, the confidence level. So in addition to that, we tested the curvilinear relationship between emergence and the likelihood of Godfather citation. As illustrated by the left chart, and this is for Hinton's case, there is a uh, the U-shaped relationship where citations to Hinton de decrease as the deep learning community grows. Um, but overall, citations to all Godfathers increase because of increasing performance and validation of deep learning. Here, we also want to highlight the scale of the y-axis. Um, in Hinton's case, the starting point was 0 0.04. Um, is, was started uh, and peaked at 0 0.06. However, for Benju and Hin uh, for Benju and Lacoon, the y-axis never reached 0 0.04. So this may indicate a different level of prominence. Uh, for our hypothesis three. Um, as expected, we do find emergence moderates the effect of social proximity. Um, as indicated by the right lines in the three charts, you will notice emergence decreases the likelihood of Godfather citation when there are prior collaborative relationships. So that is to say, at the early stages of emergence, prior collaborative relationships are essential to knowledge transfer, but at the later stages, such collaborative relationships are less important. In terms of um, the moderating fact of emergence on university assignee, as indicated by the, the right lines across the three charts, we find emergence decreases the likelihood that university assignee will cite Godfather research, which means our uh, hypothesis four is supported in this case. A second part of hypothesis four is about the moderating fact of emergence on a large corporation assignee. As indicated uh, again by the red lines across the three charts, we notice emergence increases the likelihood that corporate assignees will cite Godfather, uh, will cite Godfather research. Again, our hypothesis four is fully supported. So um, to kind of summarize our findings, uh, we confirm prior results concerning the importance of geographic proximity and social proximity. Uh, and here we would like to highlight again the moderating effect of emergence. Um, at the early stages of emergence, prior collaborative relations are essential to knowledge transfer, while at the later stages, such relationships are less important. As for assignee TAP, it is kind of shifting from universities at the early stages to large corporations at the later stages. So that brings us to conclusions. Um, during the early stages of emergence, 
knowledge kind of circulates within a narrow academic community. Therefore, knowledge transfer is largely facilitated by prior collaborative relationships with, with scientists. And as deep learning unfolds its potential, the scientific community broadens. So there is an increasing number of scientists and technology developers come into play. And during the later stages of emergence, as the requirements for the commercial uh, exploitation of scientific knowledge are in, are in place already, corporate technology developers became more uh, dominated. So uh, that concludes our presentation. Uh, looking forward to your questions and insights. Thank you. Thanks, Mimosa. You didn't have a very um, big audience, but I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Thank you, Margaret. So did I. Margaret, do you have questions? You want to lead a discussion with Mimosa or? Um, well, sure, but I have a pretty good handle on it. Um, uh, do you have any questions or Martin? I, I do. I was wondering how you uh, were measuring more specifically uh, social and geographic proximity in, in greater details. Sure. So social proximity, we actually originally looked at four kinds of social proximity. That is that the inventor was prior uh, co-author, a prior co-inventor, a prior grad student or postdoc, or a prior corporate assignee, and sorry, a corporate affiliate. Like either they worked, like Hinton is a part-time employee of Google, Lacoon's a part-time employee of Facebook, uh, Benjio has relationships with Microsoft and before that Element AI and, um, and so on, uh, and before that AT&T. So, um, so we and, and we find main effects for all four, but when we want to look at the longitudinal, we didn't have enough data for all four. So we only mm -hmm. consider co-author and co-inventor in the longitudinal analysis. And then geoproximity is just the um, the number of kilometers between the um, inventor and the godfather. Okay, and that's for their institution of work. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I was wondering whether you you thought of separating the the social proximity uh, to the institutional proximity when you mentioned that one worked at Google, another one worked at Facebook, or um, so would there be a difference uh, a difference uh, you know differential effect or? Well, I guess we just sort of do because the, when we look at assignee. That's the institution. So there is a Google effect, um, an AT and T effect. Lacoon was also at um, AT and T in the beginning, and then he moved to. Um, there is also Facebook. NEC, I think NEC back in two thousand, mm -hmm. uh, before he went to New York University, so, and then we, and then also the university employers. They also have AI patents. So Carnegie Mellon, University of Montreal, mm -hmm. New York University. Uh, U of T. So we, we do have those uh, institutional relations in addition to co-author, co-inventor, PhD student and postdoc. Okay. Um, my other question was, uh, you know, when you were presenting the graphs of, you know, one has a, a kind of, Bengio has something that is diminishing returns, Lacoon is, is a, a U-shaped curve, I oh, know, sorry, Lacoon is, is um, uh, you know, a straight line and then uh, Hinton has a U-shaped curve. I was wondering if you looked at uh, whether they were involved in, in startups themselves or if they had started uh, to venture more into industry. Since you're in, a, in an entrepreneurship uh, uh, program, Margaret, I was just wondering whether this is something that could have played, for example, to, to have this... Uh, this tailing off of the curve um, of Joshua Bengio, for instance, for example. Yeah. Well. Okay. So, um, Momo, do you want to put that slide back up? Yes. Um, so, actually, um, to be honest, I don't really have an explanation for the tailing off of the Bengio. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have an explanation for the Hinton one. You know, Hinton was just much more prominent. You know, Hinton was a star in 87 when he was recruited to Canada. Yashua Benjil was like a first year PhD student. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's just not much data for Lacoon and Bengio at the early years. There is some, you know, because they do have patent citations to their papers. It's not zero, but it's they they weren't in the same league, you know, back in the 90s. So that's why Hinton has the U-shaped curve, but um, Benjo doesn't. And the tailing off is, is interesting. That's something we just got to recently. And um, yeah, that's a bit surprising. Okay. There's other things we see, like when we dig into some of this in more detail, for instance, co-author relationships uh, have a sort of exponential effect for Bengio. So um, there's, there's different sort of things going on, but we didn't get into too many details. Okay, so is... When we look at this curve from zero to 40, when you call, you know, the, what you call the deep, li- uh, deep learning trend, does that represent years? So that's a Google, Google um, we, did, we did try it with years, but then, um, you know, Google Trends uh, mm-hmm. measures uh, searches for expressions and they have quite good data on deep learning. Okay. Um, from 2000 or so. They have data. And then we just extrapolated from uh, 1987 to 2000, like from zero to the very low, you know, Google data. Okay. And is your deep learning trend always increasing? Because that, that would yes. not be a linear time. Um... Actually, actually, I have it on my screen right here. It's, um, I don't know if I can share. Yeah, you could. You, you, we, Mimosa needs to stop sharing and then Margaret, you need to start sharing your screen. Because I'm just wondering, this is probably not a very linear step. And it's probably something that accelerates as the deep learning community becomes larger. Okay, so um, I, don't, I don't know if I can, can I share? I have to open system preferences, uh, privacy. Okay, I'm just, uh, yeah, okay. Oh, I have to quit and reopen. Oh, so, no, well, it's just a, So I'll just describe. Just it. describe what you have on your screen. <laughs> that works. Wow, that is impressive. Whoops. So, so that's the curve. It, mm. goes, it goes up until um, about 2017 or 2018. And, but our data ends in 2016. So the, the, the steep rise is from 2012 to 2016. Mm-hmm. And then it sort of flattens and then it goes down and then Google changes the way it measures, but we're not using the very last part. Okay. Because the uh, curve is I, very, very similar to the other curves that Mimosa showed on um, AI patents and um, citations to the, the research papers, their Google Scholar citations. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering what, what goes on in the ecosystem? What, we, what could we extrapolate from, you know, Hinton's ecosystem around Toronto and, and Yoshua Bengio's ecosystem around Montreal? So what, what goes on at the time that could, could explain uh, what you're measuring? Because that's, that's really interesting, you know, the three having very different um, different impact. I'm just wondering whether the other dimensions that you measured, uh, which had declining trends, but very similar trends for you know, the three graphs and the other. Um, mm-hmm. The clearest result that, um, is uh, the fact that um, you know, once companies had sufficient computing power and sufficient data, certain companies, Google, Facebook, and so on, were in a very good position to exploit AI. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the, the curves on uh, the, what happens with the companies, um, that's H4, the H4B, mm-hmm. and universities. Like, it's very clear that the universities were the chief citers in the beginning, but in the later years, the corporations were the chief citers. That's very clear. Mm -hmm. Um, But the patterns with co-inventors and co-authors do depend on the industry affiliations because Hinton 
was pure academic until 2013. He created a spinoff and Google acquired it. Like it was created so Google could acquire it. Okay. It was created in the same year it was acquired. Um, and then um, Bengio, he, he worked at at and for a couple of years, very early in his career. And then he became sort of a pure academic until he created Element AI and he got involved with Maluba, um, which was sold to Microsoft. And Lacoon was an industry guy for quite a long time. He did his most cited work in industry. And then he moved to academia. And we can talk about this qualitatively. We've tried to like have a variable and sort of put it in quantitatively, but it's, it's, it's three individual patterns. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so what would be the stylized facts that you, you did, you know, deduct from these, or you, you, not deduct is the right, wrong term in English, but. No, uh, no, fair enough, fair enough. From well, these three patterns, because you mentioned three very different types of careers, basically. Right, right, right. So, um, like, the main contribution of the paper is that I don't think anybody has really looked at knowledge transfers longitudinally through emergence. So that's, that's the main thing that we're hanging our hat on. But when we get into this, the three case studies sort of element of it, um, yeah, you're right. There's three very different careers. And then even though we have the, all this quantitative data, it's really a qualitative analysis or interpretation. And the main finding in that part is that the affiliation does matter. Like we can show um, that it matters. I, I should... Affiliation or industry affiliation? Or well, well, for instance, um, for instance, for Lacoon, um, co-inventors are more important than co-authors, typically, because he was in industry the longest. <clears throat> And of course, for Hinton, you know, once he becomes a part-time uh, employee of Google, you know, that's very dramatic what happens there because he co-authors some papers with Google employees and, you know, that, that kind of has an effect. But like Bengio's, um, he did have industry and ecosystem connections, but they, they, aren't, they aren't having, like he's more of an academic in the later years even though he's got these initiatives. He's, he's not attached to Google or Facebook. Okay, and your, your impression is that Bengio's involvement with industry in later career plays an important role. It, it plays, we haven't fully teased it out. I, like we think that that's responsible for his greater where geographic proximity has a greater effect for him because his, his industry involvement is local. Mm -hmm. uh, like Hinton, you know, Google's in Silicon Valley. He's also affiliated. A lot of his students are at DeepMind, which in the UK. So mm -hmm. he's more global. And China is citing Hinton. China, we haven't really teased into that, but China's, you know, quite visible in the data uh, in terms of paying attention to this work. Um, mm -hmm. And have you looked at international collaboration because you've just mentioned for example Hinton with partners in Silicon Valley and in the UK and there's lots of research in, in bibliometrics that shows that the more varied and the the, the high the longer the reach you have with co-authors the more citations you'll have so if, if you already have you have three strong groups you know one in Toronto one in Silicon Valley and one in the UK then you basically triple the citations. I mean, this is a crude measure, but you have the potential to triple the citations. And you mentioned that uh, Bengio's uh, was more local. So maybe that could but explain. On scientific citations, Bengio, like if we were to look at it today, like he is catching up. He's got more citations per year now than Hinton, I, or very, very close. Like he's catching up or maybe he's even surpassed them. So, um, you know, and the thing is, Benjio is quite a bit younger. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Hinton's pushing 80 now. So, um, so Benjio will probably surpass him. So it's just a matter if we were to redo your analysis with patents and, and scientific articles up to 2020 with their citations for, for two years, I guess, you could probably have a quite a different picture, right? Um. 
know. I don't know about that. Um, I, I, I don't know. What's your impression, Mimosa? Um, I was thinking, you know, adding more years, probably the, I mean, the, I, I feel like there could be some different stories within the three individual godfathers uh, about their story. And their, uh, it's also like some of their individual background as well. But I would say the general trends would stay um, the same um, because we also did in the past, we also did some um, analysis, you know, based on different time of uh, time period. Um, so like the, the, like the stronger effects uh, linger there as well. Um. And because we have uh, one of my students, Annie Passalacqua, who's online listening to this, I was just wondering whether there's a, you, there's a team effect, because you mentioned the, the importance of, uh, you know, the co-authors, for example, the co-authors in industry and in, in academia. Uh, because my student is looking at, you know, the, the innovative potential of the individuals and the team. Um, so what is the impact of, of the team? Um, could, could you tease this out in the data that you have? Because sometimes when you, you build social networks, you look at the, the centrality measures compared to the you know the most central individuals uh, or nodes in a network and uh, a person or a node would be de facto more central because they're linked to a highly central um, person so the the importance of the team surrounding these three godfathers um, could could you tease out what uh, what their role was or well, that's a very cool idea. I mean, I, I think it's great to be doing the work on looking at a team with this kind of data. That's a great idea. Um, like it's so in, in this data set, we we started with um, um, a, like close to a million patents, uh, ninety five patent families, and then we took it down to only the patents that cited the non patent literature. So mm -hmm. that's why we got down to eighteen thousand. Um, it um, yeah, looking at co-author and co-inventors uh, and teams, you know, we've looked at the data and there's certain individuals that stand out, you know, because some of the PhD students have become quite prominent, um, you know, themselves. So it, it could be done. It, it would be a lot of work, but it could be done. So that's the next paper, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> right. Right. But I think that's a very cool idea. And the nice thing about it is like this would provide a focus on like teams that matter, you, you know, because like if you just look at just, like a big database of patent data and you're getting teams, there'd be teams that matter and teams that don't matter. You know, so all of these teams would be kind of significant. OK. Um, in another question, I was wondering if I mean, the, at the beginning, you well, actually, probably not, but you, you have Lacoon who was in industry for a long time, and you had, you know, the other two who were in, in, in academia. Um, and normally, when the technology matures enough, then it kind of slowly branches out into, into industry. But, you know, these guys stayed in, in, in academia, and the, the field developed quite a lot and evolved. So, what is the lag that you measure in industry compared to academia? And do you see do you see a shift? Do you see industry taking that field further? And oh, that's a good question. I think we did look at time to citation as a dependent variable once, didn't we? Yeah, we yeah we tried to look at that. Um... But yeah, that was a long time ago. But that's an interesting idea. Looking yeah. at with with what Catherine's saying in mind. Yeah, that yeah, that's we, we looked at it as an alternative dependent variable because it took us some time to sort this all out. Yeah. <laughs> because as as industry picks up artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, then you might expect that they be reading the more recent literature, uh, which might be more applied and more pertinent. For them, as opposed to yeah. the early literature, which might be very fundamental research, but as the field develops, 
you might have more applied research that's maybe more directly pertinent or useful for for industry and right. as the proximity of these individuals to industry then the bridge becomes much um you know shorter um yeah that's absolutely true and you know if i were doing this from scratch again um if we were doing it from scratch we would consider indirect linkages too mm -hmm. um you know we only consider direct paper pat patent paper citation um but uh yeah that would absolutely be true but you know what we see on the curve that's on the screen now you, you see industry is the red line and they're they're like not paying a lot of attention um in the early days um it, it's actually with bengio where it, it crosses over universities the first mm -hmm. like earliest on uh where industries well, him and Lacoon are pretty similar. Um, is it because of the type of research that they're performing or is it because of their activities and the proximity that they might have with, uh, with industry? Or yeah, all of the research is hugely industry relevant, but, um, you know, you know, because what, like Hinton, what he's helped Google do is like huge, but, um, but I think you're right that that their affiliations like they were just probably more attuned to how to talk to industry people and work with them like so they, they both work at, at so lacoon was actually a postdoc of hinton um a long time ago and both lacoon and bengio worked at at t so they actually co-authored some stuff uh, 30 years ago mm. okay so so so, you, so i think you're right that the industry affiliation um yeah we don't have really any measure of the nature of the work you know we'd have to like do content analysis of the patent you know <laughs> application mm. which would be another phd <laughs> yeah no web but we have some uh we're, we're building some capacity in you know text mining and natural language processing mm -hmm. to try to tease out these so that might be a that might be a good uh, a good way forward but maybe you should interview these three in you know, yes once we in, in, now we, we're, we're getting to kind of where we want to and i would like to send it to them and see if i can talk to them yeah that would be great uh, maybe we can ask um, eva do for for uh you know a, <laughs> a little, uh, An intro a link yep. or a, you know a, a nudge to uh, to be able to uh, to meet these uh, these three well, that would fantastic be, individuals that would be super yeah mm -hmm. that would be super helpful